Welcome to uh, Benefit Officers Training Conference uh, training session for service credit and voluntary contributions. I want to welcome everybody that's joining us today. <clears throat> Just a few things I want to bring up and, uh, and comment on before we get started. Um, if you have any administrative questions or issues with viewing the class or hearing the class, uh, please email your um, questions or comments to the benefits at opm.gov email box. There are folks monitoring that box, and if there's problems with you accessing the site or hearing us or seeing us or just any administrative problem, they will take care of it. And uh, I'll go ahead and post that link up or that email address on our chat here in a minute. Also, this class has been recorded. It will be made available at the end of September. To access this class, you want to go through your uh, registration portal. Um, and this class will be up there so you can refer back to it. I want to introduce to you who we have here today with us. Uh, my name is Bob Mead. I am the program manager for the service credit department. Uh, we also handle the refunds of federal retirement contributions and uh, rollovers, as well as voluntary, voluntary contributions, which is going to be part of this class. And also I handle the tax uh, 1099R um, issues that may come up at the end of the year for the tax statements. With me, I have Kathy Adams. Can I flip you over there? There you are. Kathy is a, a, a legal administrative specialist here at the Retirement Operations Center. She's been with the Retirement Operations for the last 25 years. Uh, she just recently moved over to my department and uh, she is in the learning process of service credit and refunds and everything we do in my department. So Kathy's going to be online here helping uh, us as uh, we can and she's going to learn. And then also I have Pam Deal, the star of the show. Please bear with us. This is our first time ever doing this live training event. Uh, so we're learning this program as well as many others, but uh, there's Pam Deal. Now Pam, Pam is uh, a legal, she's one of my senior uh, legal minister specialists, just like Kathy is. Uh, Pam has been with the Retirement Operations Center for 34 years, and she's been in many, many departments here over the 34 years. And for the last 10 years, she's been in the service credit department. And she's uh, she's an expert on, on this uh, service credit information, and she's gonna run the PowerPoint uh, show for us. If you have any questions, please uh, ask questions over on the side. I, I would ask, since we have a large number, large class, to uh, refrain and hold to the end, if at all possible. And uh, we'll try to get your answers done and taken care of within the time frame we have. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to Pam Peel so she can start with the uh, PowerPoint slide here once we can get this going here. I just want to I just want to welcome everybody to the class and I hope you find the information useful um, and if I you know if I go too fast or you want me to stop or repeat something please let me know Okay, so the first um, part, the very first, is the forms that we use for um, if an individual wants to make a deposit or a redeposit. Um, the, the form for the civil service is an SF-2803, and the form for if they are under the re, uh, FERS retirement is an SF-3108. Now, there is an exception to that if the person has more than five years of civil service, but they elected FERS, please remember to submit the SF-3108 and provide the date of FERS election um, in Part B. It's on the part of the agency certification. 
Um, a deposit is a payment made for uh, service, temporary service for which no retirement deductions were withheld plus interest. And a redeposit is a payment equaling refunded retirement deductions plus interest. And who may make a deposit or a redeposit? Is employees currently covered under SERS, SERS offset, or the FERS retirement? Uh, and to continue with who can make a deposit, redeposit separated employees entitled to an immediate annuity. That would be at retirement. A former employee entitled to a deferred annuity. That would be that they they have to have like um, if five years in the fund and at 62 under SERS or 62 under FERS, they have five years under retirement deductions. Um, they can apply, like if they had temporary service, deposit service, they can apply to pay that back even though they're not a current employee, but they cannot um, apply to pay back temporary service or refunded service if, if they do not have title to a deferred annuity. They have to have the five years in the retirement fund. Um, a spouse or a former spouse of a deceased employee who is entitled to a survivor benefit, which that is not handled through our department. That would be handled through our survivor processing section at the time that an employee or has deceased. Uh, when a deposit redeposit can be made is any time prior to the final adjudication of a, re um, a retirement claim, like if if it's not done through the um, service credit when they are an employee and they retire and the retirement section sees that they had deposit service or refunded service, at the time they're working on their retirement case, they are going to send them out a letter asking them if they wanna pay the deposit or the redeposit back and they'll give them 30 days to make that payment. It'd have to be made in a, in a one-time payment. Sorry, I was trying to find my mouse over here on my screen. The only time that they won't do that is if it's a pre, pre uh, deposit under SERS, because typically that's not worth the time uh, and money for them to, to, to invest in that. So. Um, there's no guarantee on on a, a automatic letter going out at that time, um, only during uh, post SERS time and uh, and FERS time. But when I talk to people, I always tell them it's always best to have it paid off, you know, beforehand uh, in order to avoid any type of delays. And right now, we just so you know, we are starting to back up a little bit on the reef or on the uh, service credit applications. So I'm getting a lot in right now that says this person's retiring in a month, but it's taken us almost two months now just to get to an application. So just uh, if if at all possible, that application can be sent in with the retirement application if that person is a retirement package if that uh, employee is coming in up for retirement within a month or two. Um, that way, it doesn't uh, we don't you know don't run into any type of delays with the employee. Going back to what Bob said on the pre-deposit, I have had over the years, like even though they would take the actuary reduction, there are some people that um, are persistent in paying back that time. If they want to pay back the pre, then they need to um, like it, include a, a copy of a deposit app or make a note when the, the retirement package comes in. So that they want to pay that so the specialist back in our SERS annuity processing or FERS will give them the opportunity at retirement to pay that. The employee's responsibilities um, that they need to do is schedule an appointment with their agency benefits officer concerning if they have the FICA service or they have refunded service 
and and the employee themselves needs to make a decision as to whether or not to make a deposit or the redeposit. And again, the form for for civil service would be a standard form 2803, and for FERS is a standard form 3108. This is very important um, if they work under any previous last names were used or um, we need those names because if they took a refund years ago and it's under a previous last name, we're not going to we're not going to find it under their current name possibly because we have to have our a file search done for these um, older records or refunds. And another thing is make sure that they sign the application. We will not accept an application if it is not signed. And the, um, they would need to decide on the employee would need to decide on a payment option. And just going back to the application not being signed, the uh, prior to COVID, we had to have wet signatures. Um, since COVID, OPM has authorized the use of digital signature, the one that is recognized with your PIB card. However, um, we, if we get a digital signature or a, a signature like a fax copy signature, it has to come from the HR office, it has to come from your office in order for us to accept it. That's OPM's policy. We have to certify and we have to put a certification uh, note on each application that we do that. So if the employee, so if you do, if you sign an application and you send it to an employee, and the employee sends it into us and it happens to be a, a copy signature uh, or, or even a digital signature on your end, but the employee sends it to us, we can't accept it per OPM's policy. So make sure that uh, if they if the employee is sending in, it has to be all wet signatures it has to be mailed in. If it's coming from your office, we can accept a digital PIB signature or a you know a copied signature, non wet signature, but we have to certify that. So back to you, Pam. Okay, so um, some of the agency's responsibilities are obtain the records of service, provide the estimates of deposit amounts, and on these estimates, like um, I, over the years, like if we get a, an application in, say, a SF-3108, and we have the dates of service and we have the salary, and we get, we assume if, if we don't see part time or intermittent, we go ahead and bill it full time. Well, then we we'll get calls later that you know it was more money than what the estimate was. Well, you need to tell us if it's part time and the tour of duty, if it was intermittent service, um, and we'll get we'll go through this. If it had if they had leave without pay, we need to know that. Because it can make it, it makes a difference in the billing amount. And the agency, another responsibility is to advise the employee of the effect of making a deposit redeposit, and to provide the correct application to the employee. So when the application comes in, we've received the correct application, so we can bill them appropriately. Sorry for the delay, but I, I'm trying to juggle between two monitors here. But like she said, on the application, um, you you advise the employee of how it's going to affect their retirement. They may not necessarily want to do it after they realize how much they have to pay back or how little it may affect it. Um, so um, it's your responsibility to make sure you counsel them and, and help them make the correct choice. Again, we uh, we went already went through this, but the SF thirty one oh eight is for FERS, SF twenty eight oh three is for SERS, and.
please verify that the information on the front of the application is correct because um, if we have if we see service there that they say um, refunded then we need to do a file search for those records so it's very important that we have the dates the to and from dates of the like the refunded service so we are sure that we have received all the information needed to process the application. And this is just a review to check the EOPF for other names used and please include those on the application because we'll search under all last names. And then complete the reverse side of the application, which is part B, which is the agency certification. And um, if, you, if the applicant has service that you can't verify, please notate that on part B of the application that you could not verify that you didn't have any SF50s, um, no paperwork that you know that you can verify that type of service. And there's a checklist in the SERS and FERS handbook to complete the application. It, it just is like a checklist telling you what you need to include on the application. And please certify the application. Um, please sign the application. We will not accept it if we don't have an agency signature there. And it's always very helpful to have your direct phone number and your email address. Um, we can reach out to you those ways also. And help, um, help us help you and ensure that the application is completely based on the retirement system that the individual is currently under. Provide earnings or days worked for intermittent service. We cannot, um, we need hours or days worked for intermittent service or if you have earnings because, you know, there's going to be some, um, uh, time with no earnings, so we we need to know what the intermittent tour of duty was. Um, provide tour of duty for the part-time service, and a lot of times we'll receive the SF50s, and the SF50s won't give the tour of duty, but they'll say not to exceed like 16 hours a week. We can't use 16 hours a week. We can't assume that they work 16 hours a week because the individual may have only worked 10 hours a week. So um, in that case, we would try to go to the National Personnel Records Center for earnings and actual time worked. But right now they are, NPRC is um, not working full time because um, of COVID. So it's taking us a lot longer to get this information. Um, we went several months before and we couldn't receive the OPFs or the um, statements that we needed for the earnings. And, and one other option for the um, applicant is if everything else fails, they can go to Social Security and request an itemized statement, which this isn't the statement they get occasionally in the mail from Social Security. There's a fee for this itemized statement and it will give the dates like it goes in quarters and it will give the earnings. We can use that. But again, it's not the statement that they get in the mail. This one they have to pay is a fee. They have to pay a fee for this. And somebody in one of our classes told us that it depends on how much information they need as to what the cost of the itemized statement could be. And again, um, please provide start and end dates for leave without pay, because if we see leave without pay, we're going to have, you know, um, a time frame there that there is going to be no earnings. We're going to code it as leave without pay. Just, just to jump in here a minute. Um, we have had problems getting records from NPRC and then they opened it back up here, you know, with the, as things start opening back up, we're starting to get records. But then again, just this week, they announced due to uh, increased infections, uh, they have shut down again and only open for emergency requests. And they said 
our retirement services here requests for anything uh, retirements doesn't matter what it is is not considered an emergency so we're not getting anything from NPRC at this time and I have no clue how long it's going to take so as an alternative um, if if you want it when you counsel your employees and if they have this a time where they need to verify their time their service time you can give them that option to, to go out into the Social Security Administration and, and get their itemized earning statement at that time like Pam said, that's our last resort if we cannot find any records, but it, it takes it takes a it takes some time to do that. So if somebody's in a, a hurry to get this done and they're willing to go pay for it right now, then uh, they can go to Social Security and get that itemized statement and send it into us. This itemized statement will actually give us the name of the agency. Like it, the itemized statement can have um, jobs in the private sector, but it will give us also exactly what the earnings were when they were at the federal agency. So it is a very helpful as a last resort for them to be able to get billed for their temporary service. And we've been told it costs, I think the cheapest is about $120 is where it starts, so. This again is referring to part B, the certification by the agency. Please provide all salary changes and ending dates. Um, I've had over the years, we've had to correct statements that it'll have a beginning date and then it looks, um, the ending dates aren't given, so then we bill it straight, straight through and there has been a separation date. So we, it's very important that we have the ending dates also. Provide the date deductions began and the election date. Um, that's like if they, have civil service time. They had five years of civil service time and they had the opportunity and they elected FERS. We need the date of FERS election. Because if they did have a civil service time and, and it needs to be billed, we'll bill it as SERS and then FERS up until the date of FERS election. And on the Peace Corps and the VISTA um, applications, like they had volunteer service, it should. When it comes from the agency, the application, it should include the Peace Corps letter or the VISTA letter with the application. It, it would give us like the Peace Corps, what, the volunt what, they, what their dates of volunteer service was and the amount of money that they made monthly. They do, we do not bill them for the training for Peace Corps. They only get billed for the volunteer service. And those letters will include the to and from dates and the amount of monthly that they were paid. Uh, something to keep in mind is eight, like it's very helpful if you do an estimate for the, the individuals, they, the estimate can prevent needless applications coming in here. Like once they see what the estimate is going to be, um, a lot of times they may decide because they owe too much money on like a, a big redeposit under SERS, they may and if they may decide not to pay it if it was pre-redeposit service. And you need to like counsel them on what would benefit the employees the most. Uh, just some things to keep in mind. The um, on the deposit application, um, the employee can designate the periods of service they wish to pay. Um, they can check mark it. It says that on the front of the applications. Otherwise, service credit is paid off according to the order of precedence. First one is FERS, and then there's the post-93082 redeposit, the pre-10182 redeposit, post-93082 deposit, and the pre-10182 deposit. Uh, somebody um, that wants to pay like um, the post redeposit and the post deposit, which is kind of like the mandatory, they have to pay it to get credit for it. And before um, they even make a payment, they can call warriors and we can change the payment order but once a payment is made then we have it has 
the payment order has to be made down in our Washington DC office, our funds management group. So it's very important, like if they know what they wanna pay or when you counsel them, when you do their estimates, uh, put a note on the application about changing. One of the things you can do to change the payment order is put a note on the application. Make a request in writing if an account statement has already been sent to them. And if they do want to change the payment order, do not make a payment until um, they should not make a payment until an amended statement is received um, that we have changed the payment order. So the money will go to the account that they want to pay off first. So. Uh, when the applicant receives their statement for billing options, if a service period includes Peace Corps with any um, combination of SERS pre and post 1082, or if there's Peace Corps and it's a FERS SF3108 application, we cannot put Peace Corps on service credit with any other type of service. So if they have post 93082 redeposit SERS and they have Peace Corps service SERS, they are going to receive two CSD numbers because we cannot combine the Peace Corps with any other type of um, service credits. There are service that they want to pay back. We have to set up two CSD accounts. And then um, how this all works. Whenever they make a payment, they should include their CSD number and their date of birth on their check, because that's how they will identify where to apply that money, which CSD number to apply that money. Yeah, if they, if they send a check in without a CSD account number on it or without the payment stub, OPM is gonna take the money, but they don't know where to put it. And when that happens, we have a heck of a hard time trying to find it. So make sure they um, understand that they have to include that CSD number on there. We're going to get into pay.gov, which is a way that they can pay online via credit card or debit card, which is more secure and faster. It gets their posted to their account faster. And in my opinion, that, that's a preferred way to do it. But uh, if they do write a check and mail it in, just uh, please ensure that they need to have their CSD number on there. So once they um, receive their initial statement, they can uh, make installment payments of $50 or more can be made. Of course, pay, paying it in full avoids further interest charges. And if more than one account, again, they have to write separate checks for each account and make sure that the the CSD, the correct CSD number is on the check, so it gets plot, applied to the correct account. And whenever they receive our statement, once we've processed the deposit application, on the back of the statement is all of the payment instructions. And it explains um, about if they want to send it to, in the mail, the, the address is there, it's OPM, the post office box 979035 in St. Louis, Missouri. That information's on the back of the payment instructions, or as Bob said, they can make um, secure electronic payments at www.pay.gov, or they can fill out the form RI 16-28 authorization for direct payments from a checking or savings account. That's, uh, I had a deposit and that's how I paid mine back. I had it automatically drafted out of a savings account. But something very important with this, and there's like three boxes across the top of the form, uh, set up a new account to change an account. And they also have to, if once it, the account is paid in full, they have to fill out the, another RI 16-28 and say discontinue my automatic payment and we we will stop that payment our funds management group will um, 
stop that payment. Now, if something would happen that it wouldn't get stopped, then they automatically took out a, you know, another payment. That money will get refunded to the individual from our fun funds management group. Anything that's overpaid once the account is paid in full. Just jump in here real quick on the www.pay.gov. If they choose that option, which more and more people are doing, uh, if they have a question, if they come to you about a question on it, make sure that they elect to pay OPM. Um, we've had some people that went in there and they they went to their agency and submitted the payment to their agency. Uh, and just make sure they understand they're paying OPM, not their agency. Oh, and something else that we've had happen, somebody will send in a deposit application or an application to make deposit, redeposit, and the agency will give them an estimate. They'll attach a check to the uh, for the amount that the agency has given them on the estimate. The agency is only an estimate. Um, yeah, and Bob says if he gets them, he mails them all back because it is the agency is an estimate. Ours is the we have the final say of what the amount is they're going to owe. Now we, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of times our estimate, the the agency estimates and our amount is very close. But until the account we process the application and it goes through our uh, cycle overnight cycle, it's not an active account. So a check cannot be entered until the account is active anyhow. The CSD account is active. Yeah. Yeah, we can't accept the checks here. So once the payment is received, the payment will be credited to the individual's retirement record. Um, and, and this will never show on their leave and earnings statement. What I always advise people to do is once it's paid off and they get a paid in full statement, make a copy of that and they should give it to their HR office to include in their OPF. And that way you'll have proof that they've paid that. Because it this will not change show on the leave and earnings statement. Unfortunately, the statement that the system automatically generates, when a payment comes into the system, it automatically generates another statement and we'll mail it out automatically to the employees. However, when it's paid in full, the pay in full statement that you need to update their records is not what the system generates. Um, because it, it, the system generates a statement, paid in full statement that doesn't show the period of time that's being bought back. So that's where you can come in and, and we get these emails often um, every day pretty much to SC billings and SC receipts asking for pay in full statement. Uh, I wish they would change the system so that it would send that, but it doesn't. And uh, so, if they come into your office with a painful statement that doesn't show the period of time, just contact us. And we'll we'll send you one. And I've had this in the past where um, an individual will pay, you know, apply to pay back a deposit or redeposit, and then they decide they don't want to. Well, we cannot return that payment unless the individual separates from federal service and applies for a refund of retirement fund contributions, then we will um, refund that money to them at that time. What will happen if they retire, whenever they retire, whatever they have paid, they will use that towards for less of a reduction, or if it's a refund that's uh, service after 3191, I believe they refund, they they have to pay it all or they don't get any credit for that. They would refund it at that time. Um, the service credit periods are, um, HR should counsel employees the effect of the deposit or the redeposit on their annuity, non-deduction service or refunded service. And again, like like you said, uh, your office will counsel the employees. Um, you're going to help them decide whether they want to buy this back or pay it back. 
um, if the credit's worthwhile, if you know, depending on the money amount, um, if they don't want to pay, if they don't want to pay, pay it back, then there's no need to send in an application. But uh, just help them decide what what's best for them. Okay, so um, the effect of a paid or unpaid deposit, uh, civil service, the pre 10182 SERS non-deduction service, service would be used for title and computation if it is paid, excuse me. Service is used for title and computation of retirement benefits. There would be no reduction in their annuity. If the pre 10182 SERS service is unpaid, service will be used for title and computation of retirement benefits uh, a reduction to the annual annuity of 10% of the deposit amount. That That's the reduction that we talked about earlier for the pre. On or after 10-182 sir, service for non-deduction service, if it's paid, service is used for title and computation of retirement benefits, no reduction in annuity. Service is used, if it's unpaid, the service is used for title only. They have to pay the post 10-182 in order to get credit for that in their retirement computation. All right, before, <clears throat> before we jump into the FERS, Kathy's got a couple questions here. She's going to jump in and answer real quick. Well, I wanted, um, I'll pose them to Pam. Um, they have come across on the chat. Um, and, uh, Agency asks, I've been told that if an employee is retiring, we should not submit the paperwork for a deposit within six months of leaving. Does this still hold true? It does say that on the application, but if the person needs that for title to be eligible to retire, then we would process it. Um, a, a note should come in on it or something saying, you know, if they need to pay this time back to be eligible to retire. They have to, you know, to have title. And also, for the past two years, we've been, we have been caught up on applications to a point where we we're running within less than a month of getting them out. So it wasn't a real big issue then. Now, as I said earlier in the session here, we're starting to back up now where I think we're, we got a big influx of applications this, this summer. And I haven't even got July's entered into the system yet. So we're running by, probably about two months behind now. So some folks have gotten used to us getting them out so quick. I'm starting to get inquiries, you know, what's the status of the, this application, which just came in two weeks ago. Um, we're starting to back up now. So yes, the application does say if they're retiring within six months, please submit it with the retirement package. Uh, if we can get it done, we'll get it done. But as we back up, it's gonna be pushing it off further and further. So just keep that in mind. If they are not in a hurry or want to take a chance on us getting it done, they can you can send it to us. Um, we're going to create an account. We're going to get in the system. The person may retire, then it goes to the pending side, and pending side will end up building them if we don't get to it. But like Pam said, if, if they absolutely need it for retirement, uh, in order to retirement to retire, then send it to us and with a note, and we'll get it done. Um, a second question is, I understand that if an employee hasn't paid a deposit at retirement, that OPM is automatically sending a letter before adjudication. Despite this, several agencies are requiring the employee to submit an SF-3108 or letter requesting a buyback of that time. Is this necessary? The only time I can think of is if someone has SERS creditable service under pre-10-182 deposit or pre-3191 redeposit service? Well, we like before on the pre-10-182 service, they get the actuary reduction, but if that person is adamant that they want to pay that back, then yes, they should include the application so we know that they don't want the reduction, they want to pay it back. Because some people want to want to 
want to pay everything. They want a, like a clean slate when they retire. They want that paid. If that application doesn't come in for that pre-time, the SERS adjudicators aren't right. going to send, send them a bill. They're not going to they're not going to bill them at all. Right. So we so they would, need to make sure that if they want to pay it back, they make sure that it comes in with it. They make the intent that they want to pay that back, so they see it in SERS annuities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so to get my glasses on, see what's great. Yeah, yeah, we um maybe go back one or wait, did we do this one? No. Okay. Sorry, I didn't flip it. So um the effect of paid and unpaid deposits under FERS. Um the of course FERS. There are a few exceptions to this rule, but FERS can only pay back FICA service to 1231.88. Uh, service after 1231.88 FICA service is not, um, not allowed, but we do have some exceptions to that rule we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. Yeah. But if it's paid, the first deposit is paid, they'll use it for title and computation of retirement benefits, and there will be no reduction in their annuity. But if it's unpaid FICA service, service is not used for title or computation of the retirement benefits, which annuities will send them out a deposit letter asking them if they want to pay that back, if it's at retirement, if they didn't do this prior to retirement under this under the service credit system. The, um, the effect of paid unpaid deposits under FERS. Again, the employee can pay for the FERS non-deduction service performed before 1-1 of 89. Generally, FERS non-deduction service is not creditable after 1231-88, but we do have a few exceptions to that to this, that rule. Kid service, which is service um, through the Department of State, which is service performed abroad after 1231 of 88 and before 524.98 under a temporary part-time or intermittent appointment. And it's um, through the Foreign Service Act of 1980. Usually the, the pit service that I have seen an actual IRR will come in from the Department of State telling us what the what their contributions were and what the agency contributions were. Um, a service performed under the Foreign Service Pension System, they can uh, buy back time after 1231.88. Service as a Senate employee child care center worker, that also is one of the exceptions to the 1231-88 FICA rule. Service performed under the Federal Reserve Bank plan and, and service, service performed under the non-appropriated fund, service under the Public Law 107-107 that can be used for title to an annuity under FERS, but it is not used in the computation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, SERS refunded service that they did not have five years civil service. We we flip that using a factor and um, to flip it to what the and it would be a FERS redeposit then. Service before 1231 and 90 with either the Democratic or Republican senatorial campaign or national congressional employees. Um, another exception to the first post 88 rule is uh, Peace Corps. Um, I'm on 27. Yeah, I think you jumped. Go ahead. Oh, did I? I got you. Go OK. Service as a volunteer or volunteer le leader in Peace Corps can buy back after 1231.88. Service as a VISTA volunteer. Service before 1221-2000 with the Library of Congress Child Development Center. Service as a senior official. 
and congressional employees that do not elect program coverage and are subject to the Social Security Amendment of 1983. Is more exceptions. You see, there's a lot of exceptions there, but we rarely see these. Yes, I haven't seen some of these. I have never seen them. Mostly just a Peace Corps time. Yeah, I did skip. Sorry. Yeah, the Peace Corps is uh, uh, one that we do a lot of applications. Okay, so the effect of paid, unpaid FLIP SERS refund due to the National Defense Act. The refunded SERS service that flips the FERS. And this, it doesn't matter when the refund service ended. If sir, if it is paid, service is used for title and computation of retirement benefits, and there would be no reduction in their uh, retirement annuity. If they, if it's unpaid, they would only use that service to give them title to an, a retirement, but it would not be used in their computation. No extra work. Right. Okay, so the effects of paid or unpaid redeposit under SARS, the pre-3191 SARS refunded service, and if it's paid, services used for the title and the computation of their retirement benefit, so they wouldn't receive the reduction in their annuity. If it is unpaid, services used for title and the computation of retirement benefits, but they would get the reduction in their monthly annuity based on the age and the retiring employee at the annuity commencing date and the amount of the redeposit due. For um, SARS redeposits on or after 3-1 of 91, SARS refunded service, if it is paid, service would be used for the title and computation of retirement benefits, but and they would not receive a reduction in their annuity. If it is unpaid, service would be used for title, giving them eligibility to retire. Okay, the, um, the effects of the paid unpaid redeposit due to when the law changed on 10-28 of 09, because before, prior to that law, People that were under the FERS retirement system, they could not, um, if they took a FERS refund and then they came back to work for the federal government, they could not pay that refunded service back. They, they lost entitlement to that time. But when the law changed um, on 10-28 of 09, they had to be employed on or after 10-28 of 09 for the FERS. They could now pay FERS refunds back, FERS redeposit refunded service, regardless of when the refund service ended, if they pay it, service is used for title and the computation in their retirement annuity, and they get no reduction in their annuity. If they do not pay it, service is used for title only, but they would not get credit for that. Those years of service, if they don't pay that refund back, are not going to be used in the computation of the retirement benefit. We have a couple more questions. Okay. Here. Can I ask them? You want to go ahead? Uh, well, there's a question here about can we send the 3108 for FERS refunded service if an employee does not remember having received the refund? We get a lot of inquiries on this uh, um, because, of course, your office doesn't know if they ever took a refund or not. And we get a lot of <laughs> refund or a lot of inquiries to the SC Billings email box. When in actual, actuality, they should be going to the correspondence department. And the correspondence department is responsible for pulling files and, and answering inquiries. I We try to answer them if we get them in SC Billings email box. But uh, if you get an employee that is asking if they took a refund, they can check with us. Please have them go to the correspondence department at retire at opm.gov. R E T I R E at OPM.gov, or they can fax 724 794 6633. The correspondence department will have to 
typically pull records if it's not online in order to respond or if it's older service back in the 80s which is not on a refunded system um, they would have to pull old records to respond another question is what happens if we've tried all avenues to find out intermittent days hours and we cannot do you charge them as if it's full time and then do we we provided credit as if it was full time even though it was intermittent intermittent no um, because we know it was an intermittent appointment and they didn't work full time so they only get credit for days work days or hours worked and there again within national personnel records center that is one of the scenarios that we would go asking for earnings and actual time worked but at this point we cannot do that um, so this is where i was talking about if they can go to social security it's going to cost them but if they can get an itemized earnings statement for that period of service that period of time that then we can use that from social security but it's going to cost them a fee yes. to get it yes and can these applications be submitted through OPM Secure Portal? Well, we have, in order to get OPM Secure Portal portals, um, it's going to have to be going to someone that sent that support secure portal to, but it's a tongue twister. So with SC Billings, we send all our SC state, or statements out under the secure link. So yes, so you can send <coughs> applications back if you have that portal going to the SC Billings email box. Um, one more question. Another employee wants to pay for a period of service from another prior agency. However, the SF50s in the EOPF only stated part time, but not the tour of duty. <clears throat> we are unable to verify the number of hours of the tour of duty. Hence, we are unable to calculate the deposit amount. What can be do done in this situation? There again, that is something that we would go if we received that application or the agency could go to National Personnel Records Center asking them for earnings. We would use the earnings for that part time service, but because of COVID, we're not going to be able to get that information and they again, they could go get a Social Security earnings statement and that will give us the earnings. Um, like when those earnings statements come in, it, they do them by quarter, like every three months. So we would need, still need the agency to provide us with the dates, the to and from dates of service. But that is one way for the individual get the um, itemized earnings, and we could use those to bill for that part-time service or intermittent service. And one last question: How quickly can a redeposit be processed? That all varies on a number of things. Right now, we are running about two months. If it, if a deposit app comes in and we have everything we need and it's a straightforward deposit app, uh, we're getting them out probably within two months right now. If it's a temporary service that we need earnings for, that you know that's kind of out of our control there until we can get the itemized earnings that we need or MPRC records. So that there's no telling on that one. But a straightforward. Um, refunded service um, or you know FICA time that's that we have earnings for or full time uh, where there's no delays we right now we're running about two months just under two months probably about six weeks if there is service um, like a lot of times people amaze me that they'll have their old w-2s when they from years ago and it will give the fica earnings on there like um like you know for the year or we, possibly we have been able to use those on occasion but not always um we do have a letter that we call verify service letter that um it, the kind of the burden of proving it relays We've tried everything to get the information and we haven't been able to. We'll send that out to the applicant telling them different things that they may be able to send in. Normally, the, the most I've seen is the W-2s with the FICA earnings on it. But we do, we do try to accommodate them, but if we can't get the information we need, we can't bill without, you know, without some kind of proof. 
And sometimes if it's older service and we have IRRs that are in our holding files, like say they had FICA service and then they went to a covered service at the same agency, sometimes we are lucky enough that those earnings, those FICA dates and earnings will be on included on those IRRs. Not always, but that's something that we will also see. And another, another one here. If a SERS employee with more than 42 years of service and has unpaid pre-82 temporary time, does OPM automatically use excess contributions to cover that temporary time? I believe so. What about the That'll be done at retirement. And what about post-82 temp time? Um, that may be something um, if you could. This might be one. We're going to have to follow up on it. Yeah. We're going to have to follow up on this one. I, I know I had a couple years ago a case where something similar, similar to this and the employee had to pay the deposit in order and then get it refunded to him. But I can't remember exact scenario on that. So we'll, we'll have to check back, check on this and get back with you on it. Um, if whoever sent that email, if you want to send that to the SC Billings email box or you can email Pam or myself, our emails will be at the end of this briefing. Um, that way we can uh, get back with you on it. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, any more here? Why can't you accept a PIV CAC signature directive? Well, unfortunately, okay, the question is, why can't you accept a PIV CAC signature directly from their employee? How is it any different from that and them submitting it to us? Unfortunately, it's not, it's not my policy. <laughs> um, and I, I can't tell you why why we can't. OPM came down, and before COVID, we couldn't even accept the CAT cards. OPM did not recognize our director, did not authorize it, did not recognize it as an authorized signature. So since COVID came about, um, they have come down and authorized us to accept CAT card yeah. signatures, PIV signatures, but it has to be certified and we have to put a form to it and we have to certify it's coming from HR office and not the, not the employee themselves. Uh, I can't answer why they're doing it that way. It, you know, it, it makes doesn't make sense to me. But uh, we 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 have to follow OPM's uh, policies, and unfortunately, this is one that they have established. When we are not under a pandemic, how do we ask NPRC for earnings? Is there a form we can use? Well, we have our form here. Like OPM has our form. Um, that would be something that they would have to ask their agency benefits officer or something, how they get, I know we have our OPM form, but I, I don't know how agencies um, request those. I apologize for not knowing that, but I, I don't know. Okay, another one on signatures again. If the HR office signs with a PIV and sends it to the employee to sign, and submit via regular mail to OPM, is that sufficient? Uh, unfortunately not. If it's not a wet signature, in order to accept it from the employee, it has to be wet signatures on both blocks. The only way we can accept any type of PIV signature or non-wet signature is if it comes from the HR office. And you can email it to the SC Billings email box or you can fax it to us. That information will be on the slides here later. Anything else here? Um, I'll keep reading through if she wants to continue on. I see. A, I see a lot of questions on the on the signatures. Lots of questions on signatures. Is a digital signature okay for all forms if it comes from HR? No. There's only certain forms that is authorized. If you reviewed, refer back to as a bell twelve dash. There's a bell out there that identifies what signatures and then further from that we have our regulations here that further break it down with the with the certification page that we have to put on these forms for our purpose though it was the service credit forms are the only ones applications are the only ones in my department that we can accept digital signatures everything else that we use in my department has to have a wet signature but email us if you don't know that bell number email us uh, we'll send you that bell 
number. I can't remember what it, it yeah, might be. It might be in this briefing later. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. But I think it might be in this briefing here as we get to it. Any more questions? Well, the, the OPM policy, it, it's a, uh, it comes down from our operations support and it's a policy, internal policy. So there's no number or anything you're going to find on that. And I can't release OPM internal policies out. I was just trying to look through to see which ones are already been answered uh -huh. before. Hey, Pam, here's one. I have an individual that has about six years that only FICA was taken out. Can she pay that deposit into Social Security? No. I don't think so. Pay it to Social Security? Yeah. Pay. I think she has to be covered under a covered service right. in order to pay back any FICA service. Right. Is okay. she a current federal employee? Yeah. I have an individual that has about six years that only FICA was taken out. Can right. she pay that deposit into Social Security? Well, she can pay it to us. Like she only paid into Social Security while that temporary appointment was going on. Right. Is so, it prior? Is she for? I don't know. That's all. Okay. That's all. It's on there. Whoever asked that question, <laughs> asked if, if we didn't question. answer it <laughs> adequately, please email us. We'll get this information out to you. Because if it was before, if she's first and it was before twelve thirty one eighty eight, other than if it was an exception to the rule. So you she know, has to be under a cover. Right, she has to, to be. She time. can't like pay that to gain title to an annuity down the road five years. Okay, we'll, we'll move on here. Okay. So where did I skip page? No, talk about interest okay. rates. Okay, so um, we're now to the interest rates, and these interest rates are also included on the back of the CSD billing statement. So. Um, before, from 1948 to 84, it was 3%. And then in 1985 is when the, ver the variable interest rates started. And as you can see from this chart, <coughs> some years they um, were higher. You know, they were pretty high, but this is the rates that are used whenever we're calculating deposits or redeposits. And we enter the information in in the system calculates the interest due. As you can see, back in the 80s and 90s, interest rates were very high. So those that are paying back a redeposit or FICA time from the 80s and even 90s, sometimes, well, most times their redep redeposit is going to be, the interest is going to be more than double what they actually were was refunded. It's because the interest rates were so high back then, plus all the years, you know, tacked on to it. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, interest rates? No. Let's try and look at these uh, some of these questions. Okay. So I, Do you want me to move on? Yeah. Okay. So um, an overview to this um, presentation is: please be sure to send in the correct application. If they have SARS time, like the but they're FARS and they're going to have a civil service component in there annuity we will we need the FARS application and we will bill that time as SERS so it'll be a FARS retirement with the civil service uh, component if they had the, uh, the five years um, intermittent days and hours work part-time tour of duty anything that you can provide that could help us bill you know um, th this type of service is very helpful and we appreciate it because we can't we can't like with intermittent service they get credits for while actually employed we can't give them full-time credit for that uh, and please remember to provide all pay salary changes and ending dates of each period Again, back to um, this is the agency certification. Um, date current deductions began and the date of FERS election if they had the opportunity to elect FERS. And please provide um, your phone number, your email address, and the postal address in case we need to contact you for additional information. 
or something isn't clear to us on the application. And um, the contact information for our service credit department. Well, of course, there's our website at www.opm.gov. And um, this SC Billings box is answered in our department. Our uh, weekly a customer service specialist answers emails and uh, prints off the applications. But you, they can send the applications, or if you have a question on a status or calculation questions, um, you can send it to SC Billings at opm.gov. And a um, if you have, you need a receipt for a payment or there's payment problems or paid in full statements, um, SC receipts at opm.gov. That's our um, what the email address for our Washington, D.C. office. Um, we also send out paid in full statements like, you know, if you come to us with that question also. Yeah, a lot of you probably see me. I, I jump in that box yeah. quite a bit to help keep it up to date. So um, I send them out. So that that pretty much covers our service credit portion of this. We're going to get into voluntary contributions here in a minute, but I want to look at any more questions on service credit before we go to voluntary contributions. Well, I have one. Um, one of our previous benefits officers provided a document that stated if intermittent service was less than three months, for which there is no documentation of time worked, it would be treated as full time, and OPM would calculate the deposit based on that. Is this document I provided accurate? I previously have um, adjudicated FERS claims, and there were times that we would allow uh, full time service for less than three months of intermittent service when we exhausted all avenues uh, uh, for that um, to try to verify that time. I am new to this section, so I have to defer to Pam as to how they handle it in the service um, credit section. Well, I know we have always people prior. Yeah, we don't assume. Yeah, that we always even if it was less than three months, we wanted we need to the information right. needed. You know what I mean? So at adjudication, I think by that part of it, we are pretty much we've exhausted every avenue that we can. Um, but they were rare uh, that we would allow that, that to be presented as full time service up and, to three months. Well, if that's what they're doing in adjudication side, that's I don't know if that's now, we can't answer for the adjudication side. Yeah. On service credit side, we need we need yeah. the accurate data in order to bill them correctly. That's correct on, on our end. And I, I'm pretty sure that I had talked to Deb Sontag about that when I she was my go to person. Here's Some things just don't have an easy um, answer. And they're not always cut and dry, but we do try to follow our regulations as closely as we possibly can. And the law. So what, okay, here's a simple one. What, what happens if you have multiple applications sent to your office? Well, that, of course, we don't want because it just creates more work here and it backs up the workload as that we have already. So <coughs> like I said, if you check with the SC Billings box before you send another application, right now, I'm, like I said, six weeks, we're out about six weeks before we're even getting them in the system to know that we received it. And uh, we just have too many to go out there and, and you know, look through each one to see if we received the application. So if you could just check through the SC Billions email box, um, give it give it a couple months, six weeks, eight weeks, and then check if you need to check and see if we received it. Um, we can answer you that way before you send another one into us. Um, when submitting the SF3108 for FICA service, do you need copies of the SF50s? We don't need those unless, um, you know, if we get them, that's fine. We we appreciate them. But if they fill out the part where it gives, you know, the, they give us the to and from dates and if it was part-time service, full-time service, beginning and ending dates and salary changes, 
that's all we need. But I know a lot of agencies will send in the SF-50s. Like if the SF-50s would have the tour of duty on it, we definitely want that unless it's noted on Part B that the agency certifies. If an employee has started paying on a deposit in a previous agency and transferred, would they go to the last finance office to get the IRR worksheet to restart the deposit at the new agency? What they could do is just contact us, and if they've already got a bill, been billed, we'll update the interest and make sure we have the right um, current address, and we can send them out a new statement, even though they've moved agencies. On the IMI statement, you're more familiar with them because someone's asking if, how do you determine it's government federal work versus civilian work? Well, on the itemized statement, when they come in from Social Security, they'll have the name of the employer listed there. It'll have like if they worked for a, let's say a store in the private sector, and then they came to a federal agency, it'll actually have the federal agency's name and address on there. We won't use what was uh, private sector just what the federal agency information is. Oh, by the way, someone said here, uh, please don't go back and forth on a Zoom presentation. It's giving me a headache. Unfortunately, we're not doing that. It's, I know what you're talking about because I see it's jumping back and forth between the slide and you see Pam there and then it goes to slide only and it goes back to the two. That's the system's doing that. Um, we're not doing it. I could actually take Pam off. That might help. Pam would like that too, so let me get her over there. So service was performed after 12-31-1988. You cannot buy that, buy back that. You cannot pay back a deposit. The service worked 9-4-94 through 9-27-97, and from 6-2-98, and 420 2002 and she got credit for leave but not for retirement under FICA. She cannot pay this back, correct? That's correct, unless it was under one of those special exceptions. Now, is she civil service or is she FERS? Because civil service can buy back time, that only applies to FERS people. But, um, you know, civil service can pay back FICA service after that. Can you read the correspondence phone number and fax number again, please? Okay. Their email is retire at opm.gov. And their fax number is 724 7946633. You want me to turn mine off to me? No, we're not talking. Okay. Okay. okay, I think we're going to move on just in the sake of time to cover voluntary contributions. There, there is a lot of questions here on service credit, which I was kind of expecting, but I'm not sure if we would have time to get to them all. But um, we're going to move on to long-term contributions right now so we can get the that uh, discussed and then we'll get back to questions. Okay, the voluntary contributions applies to only SERS employees. Um, if they're covered by FERS, but they were SERS um, they could contribute while they were subject to SERS deductions, but FERS employees cannot have a voluntary contribution account. And to establish a voluntary contribution account, um, they, they have to complete the form that um, is just one page, it's a front page, an SF-2804 to have an account created. 
and those are sent into our office here and um, one of our customer service representatives in our department they um, set the account up and assign it a voluntary contribution number uh, account number um, that, but to set up a voluntary contribution you cannot owe a deposit or a redeposit those have to be paid in order to set up a voluntary contribution account and um, on the 2804 um, please be sure to um, answer these correctly because i have a case on my desk right now that um, the first question there was do you have any civilian government service during which no civil service retirement deductions were taken from your salary? And when the 2804 came in uh, back in 2018, these questions were all marked no. Well, this person has, so a voluntary contribution account got set up. This person paid money into the voluntary contribution account. And whenever her retirement case came in, to OPM, there was an agency estimate that included deposit service, unpaid deposit back in the 80s. And on the certified summary that was completed by the agency, they also had the dates of service and unpaid deposit. So this individual paid money into this voluntary contribution account because she had unpaid deposit. And, and this voluntary contribution account was already paid out to her, she was not entitled to earn any interest. So she has to send us back the money for the interest that she earned. Um, she will get her contributions. She was able to keep her contributions, but she has to return the interest that she earned on this account to OPM. But she should have never been able to set up a a uh, voluntary contribution in the first place. And we here at OPM, unless somebody has applied to pay back a deposit with FICA service, or on occasion we have a payroll card in the IRR that lists FICA to and from dates and the earnings, we don't know that these people have FICA service unless we are told we don't have copies of their SF50s. So it's very important for these forms to be filled out correctly so we don't set up accounts that they should not be eligible to have a voluntary contribution account. Um, and they can, uh, a voluntary contribution account, um, when they're paying in, in, they can pay in multiples of $25, $50, $75, et cetera. And they can contribute up to 10% of their lifetime federal earnings, which we here at Boyers, we do not um, do the lifetime earnings. Those amounts are calculated in our DC office. They do the lifetime earnings. And the interest earned um, is like 3% through 1231.84. After that, <coughs> excuse me, the variable rate compounded annually at 1230, 12 to 31 of every year. And you may contribute until final adjudication of your of your retirement. And they get a statement every year at the end of the year telling them what they have in their voluntary contribution accounts. That I believe also comes from our DC office. Sure. <clears throat> the, I saw a question in here about that. Uh, setting up a voluntary contribution account after retirement. Um, as you see there, they, they cannot. It has to be set up prior to them retiring, because when they do retire, the accounts, the accounts can be closed at that time. There's no interest past their retirement. They there's no interest calculated afterwards. We have, have had some instances where somebody's been retired for several years and they come in to check on their voluntary contribution account and, and we look at it and find, and we see that it was not closed when they retired and earn interest for you know a few more years. Well, that interest is all gonna be subtracted from what they had earned back to where that date of the retirement. So it has to be a uh, set up and uh, it's closed out at retirement. Um, so whenever um, at the time of retirement, the individual can elect to purchase additional annuity 
with their voluntary contribution account. And for each $100 in the VC, it provides an annual annuity of $7 plus is that 20 cents for each year, full year retirees over age 55 at the time the annuity begins. Begins. Okay. I should put my glasses on. Can elect, um, they can elect anyone to be the beneficiary. No consent is needed with or without survivor benefits. The refund or a roll over, they can elect to receive the money and um, have us withhold 20% tax out of the interest, or they can roll over to an IRA to defer the tax. If an individual. We're seeing a lot of that because there's a tax loophole there where a lot of, a lot of CSRS folks are putting a lot of money into a voluntary contribution account toward the end of retirement. And then they can roll it over, you know, $100,000 or more over into a Roth account. Um, so that's a tax loophole right there, and a lot of people are taking advantage of it. If they separate from service with an entitlement to a deferred annuity at age 62, the interest would continue to accrue to the beginning date of the annuity if used to purchase additional annuity or if refunding the voluntary contribution interest would only be paid to the date of separation um, when they separated, but were not entitled to an immediate annuity. So the refund of voluntary contribution, the forms that we see most often in our department, cause our refund, um, CSS's customer service specialists, they process the refund of voluntary contributions if the individual does not want it added to purchase a dis additional annuity. So they would fill out the, um, the RI-38-124, the application for a voluntary contribution, and um, there's options there of how they want it paid if they want it rolled over, if they want it paid to them, 20% federal tax withholding, if they want it to go to a Roth IRA, they would um, need to give us the financial form where they want it rolled over to, an address. They have different options. It's And uh, sometimes people will receive these applications, um, 38, 124, and they'll have uh, block two. They'll have addition, uh, block one marked additional annuity, or they'll have block two um, checked, send me additional information after I retire. So what we would do with these is whenever we see that there's been a CSA claim number assigned, we would send this application back to civil our civil service retirement department, and they would proceed from there with these. Um, adding additional annuity or if they want information before they decide how they want this uh, voluntary contribution account paid. And it's important there that when you see lump sum refund of voluntary contributions, that's highlighted with the red arrow. We need to know when they want it. Yes. When they want it rolled over or, or refunded out. Yes. Because as soon as we get this, that's when that is what tells us when to initiate the closure of the account. And we and the customer service specialists have to go to our DC office to close the account up and they they actually send us the information as to how much is in the account and how much interest is there. Yes, after they do the 10% earnings limitation. And um, when they do set up a VC account, they can also um, complete a 16-28 for the voluntary contributions to have it automatically withdrawn out of account if they choose to do so. Um, it's the same one that they would use for service credit to set up the payoff and deposit or redeposit. Uh, usually on these voluntary contributions, um, a lot of times 
it's just a one large sum of money that they'll put into these. Um, I don't know how many people use the, the direct payments to pay into the voluntary contribution. Again, they can, if you see this form there in the middle there, you can see this is the exact same thing that you, you will see when you go to pay.gov or they will see when they go to pay.gov. There's three types of payments that you can pay to OPM through www.pay.gov. One is service credit, one is life insurance premiums, and one is voluntary contribution. So they can set up automatic withdrawals from their bank accounts to one of those three for our purposes, service credit or voluntary contributions, or they can go on to pay.gov and use a credit card or debit card and do the same. Um, and this is just some contact information for the voluntary contribution. Um, for more information, you they can visit the website at www.opm.gov. And to establish VC accounts, we have two of our customer service representatives that will, um, when they receive the SF-2804, if it's completed correctly and everything, and they, um, see if there's any records in our holding files or they will the Tracy Stalker at Tracy.stalker at opm.gov or Karen.drew at opm.gov. They are uh, the two people that will set up the voluntary contribution account and send and will send out the paperwork to the applicant giving them their CSV number with instructions. And uh, the general VC questions or the lifetime earning calculations um, is this is in our um, the website is in our DC office voluntary contributions at opm.gov for any questions that they may have concerning their voluntary contribution accounts. I don't know if there's a question yet on this or not, but the the forms 2804 has to be wet signatures. We can't take CAC or PIB signatures on those. As, as well as the 3124 applications, those have to be all original signatures on them as well. And the financial forms should be original. Financial forms as well. This is my contact information and Pam's contact information. Um, if you want to email Kathy, she's Catherine dot Adams at opm.gov. We'll have to add her to the next training session. So this concludes our briefing. So um, we can go through some of these questions some more here. Okay. <coughs> if they did um, Peace Corps time and didn't have any retirement deductions, are they still eligible for a deposit? Yes, we would need, they are one of the exceptions that they can pay back uh, after 1231.88. And um, there's a letter that comes from Peace Corps that should come in with the, the applications and it gives their training dates of service and their volunteer dates of service and the monthly amount that they received while they were a volunteer. We only bill for the volunteer time. The training time we cannot they cannot purchase that time back in addition to that question there was another peace corps question does the amount of the educational award have to be on the vista verification letter or will you accept w-2s along with the verification letter no it should be with the verification letter of the educational award Um, another person asked, when will student hires hired after 1989 be able to make payments? When the law changes. And mine will be the first one, although I'm not student hire, but I have temporary time. Can you imagine how many we would have if that changed? Yeah, we they they a couple years ago, oh, maybe about 2015, there was a I think a proposal in one of the laws that was before Congress that didn't get passed, but it was uh, in order to allow those after 1989 to pay or buy time back. 
But until our congressmen and our, our administrators change that law, that's, uh, that's what the holdup is. Why are agencies not provided a copy of a paid in full statement of an employee's deposit. It's up. I always advise any individual I talk to make a copy of your paid in full statement and give it to your HR office. Um, so they can put it in your OPF and they have proof that you've paid it. Yeah, our systems are not set up yes. to send statements to the numerous HR offices that uh, exist. Um, so it's 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 on the employee to to get that painful statement and turn it into your office. I have a retiree that took a refund of SERS from 1982 to 1998, refunded in 1998. Now he wants to make a redeposit. He elected FERS in 2008, so he is under FERS. Does he make the redeposit under FERS or SERS? So he's still working. He's, he's still planning on retiring okay. December 2022. So he elected FERS. So we would bill that SERS refunded service as SERS redeposit. And I mean, he would fill out an SF-3108. The agency would give us the date he elected FERS, but that time would be billed as SERS. So when he retires, he would be a FERS retirement with a civil service component because he had over five years from 82 to 98, I believe is what you said. Yes, 82 Yeah, to yes. So we, it would be billed at the SERS rate. An employee is retiring at the end of the year. I have sent several requests to verify the amount of her refund because there is no information in the EHRI portal. Can you suggest the best way to find out the refund amount? several requests to the correspondence department through fax retire at opm.gov if the time if the time is after 1990 email me and i'll look it up for you what should be done if an employee has already purchased deposit service but looking in their eopf at the application that was submitted you can see that not all the correct information was submitted, so they were billed incorrectly. Either they should owe or be refunded. Question. Okay, so we need, they can email that into me. I'll have to, like I would need the details and. Um, yeah, if there's any, if there's any directions. questions on any of the billing that has been completed that that you think is wrong, um, email. Well, Pam, on this one, you said she said you can email her, but typically you want to email the SC Buildings email box with um, pretty much the details and any evidence you have there uh, so that we can relook at the case and uh, recalculate it if necessary. And we, we would need another deposit app. I don't know if it was done years ago or when, it, when the first one was submitted, giving providing us with the correct information. Is any TBA service after 123188 potentially creditable and able to have a deposit made for it? Deposit service, it would follow FERS rules, no time after 123188. But if they took a refund and it, um, under SERS, we would just bill it to and from, like if they're SERS to and from date and a redeposit, but let's say they're FERS, but they're talking about deposit, right? Deposit service? Yes. Okay. I don't believe that deposit, they can pay back FICA service with TVA after 123188. I mean, that's something that they can send an email and I'll have to research for sure, but I believe I just was researching for FICA service and I couldn't find anything that they can pay back because it would follow FERS rules. When the employee gives us a copy of the payment being credited, what form number would 
be uploaded in the EOPF? What's that? The painful statement. Do you have a copy? You got one right there. What's that? All right. Um, I just had I just had the back of it, but it's uh. RI 36-23. Now that's the one that we send to, that painful statement we'll send to your office if you request it or we send it to the individual, individual if they request it. And that's what gets turned in. And that's, uh, again, your your office uploads that, that form and we'll update their records. Again, I just want to remind everyone that this is being recorded and will be available at the end of September. There was a question here about we referenced back in slide 10 about the the handbook. What handbook we referring to? That's the SERS FERS handbook. And you can up you can access that via the OPM.gov website. And and in there it breaks it down per chapter. You look for the service credit chapter and you should find what you need in there. When you say title to an annuity, does that mean the eligibility for retirement? Yes. Yes. Hello, I'm sorry I'm a little confused. OPM will send out a letter to the employee asking them if they want to make a deposit, redeposit without the application being submitted in the retirement application. That is correct. If, if at adjudication, um, there is redeposit or deposit owed. Uh, OPM will send a letter to them uh, if, if it's appropriate that they could buy it back and how it will affect their annuities. I did not want to ask. That. Yeah, here's a question about what what is the process for getting OPM to recalculate a deposit? I did not indicate on the 3108 that an employee worked part time versus full time. You just have to contact us. And like I said, the best way to do it is through service credit, the SC Billions email box. And just uh, we need to know, um, you know, that he was part time and we need the documentation showing part time and, and the hours they worked. And then we can recalculate it. For NAV service, NAV, are you saying that even just to be used for eligibility that a deposit must be made? Well, there's there's all those different laws now with that non-appropriated fund, 104, 106, 107, 107. Um, In deposit redeposits, we do not bill for non-appropriated fund time. That's all done back at retirement, I believe, by the senior LASs back there. Is that right, Kathy? Well, they review it um, and decide whether a deposit can be made. Yeah, but we don't do it in service credit department. It's done at the time of retirement. If they're eligible. If they're okay. eligible, right. Yes, most of the time it does have to be cited under a public law. Okay, yeah, there's like that reel that came out in 2016, I believe. I did that, um, hopefully that answered that question. NAP is a, uh, an exception sometime to the rules. Right. So each individual situation would, would need to be reviewed by a senior specialist. Bell 12102, somebody just, I just saw that, somebody posted it on there. That's the bell you, that you want to refer to for the signatures <coughs> that we were discussing. Bell 12-102. There are a lot of questions. <laughs> I 
questions. All right, we're reading through some questions here, so um, sorry for the pause. When an employee retired and had excess retirement contributions, will OPM apply that towards the deposit or redeposit? Okay, that's something that that was asked earlier. Um, would, we would have to get back to them with that because didn't somebody ask that earlier? Like if they have, they have over 4111, they're going to get an excess contribution refund that it's paid back in annuities, civil service. But I can't remember for sure if they take both the deposit and the redeposit out of the excess deductions. I, I think I can't remember. Um, she can email and I'll find out. She can email me if you want to tell her that. And because I, I don't know offhand. Will OPM review an employee's claim for creditable for federal service before they retire? No. If, if the employee is claiming, or they want to know if they got credible service before they retire, we don't have records on the employee. Um, the agencies, your office maintains their personnel records and payroll records. So if they have time that they think they can buy back, they're going to have to go through your office and, of course, apply um, with the appropriate application for us to review it. For a death in service case, would a family be given a deposit opportunity? I believe so, because I think that's one of the yeah. on the real or one of the slides, but yeah. that'll be done back in service credit or survivor yeah. processing. Yes, they, they they do that. Yeah. How does an employee request an updated statement? I have submitted a request for them and they got mailed the same statement that was calculated years before and hadn't been updated for accrued interest. Um, I had my mic off. I don't know if you overheard that through the other speakers, but uh, if they need an updated statement, go through SE receipts or SE billings. Now, we do update the interest every time we send one out, although it does not show the current date on the statement. It always will show the date that the bill was initially calculated, right. and that could, that confuses a lot of people. And if they were billed like years ago, we always like to verify that we have the correct mailing address on the CSD statement. So when we do update the statements or send another one that we're sending it to the appropriate address. Is OPM going to expand EHRI to allow agencies to pull paid in full deposit receipts? What I know about EHRI is that they don't have, our, our deposit receipts aren't, that system is not connected to EHRI. So you're not gonna be able to pull those receipts from EHRI. And I, I as far as, if ever in the future that's a capability that could happen, I, we don't know that. It certainly will make things a lot easier on our end if you guys can pull the, the, the receipts. If you need to request a refund status for an IRR, you email to retire at opm.gov. Now, if we have an application here, for a former employee that has submitted a refund application, or even a 3124 for a current employee that, that you want to check the status of, you can check with us. But you should be going through retire at opm.gov if you want to pull or request an IRR.
I have an employee who retired from the TVA and is receiving a small retirement annuity from TVA. They are now with Social Security Administration and are eligible for a voluntary retirement. Will that TVA service be included in their service history? Can this employee receive two retirement payments, one from the TVA and one from SSA, which would actually, SSAs would be OPM. Well, if he's receiving, if they're receiving a retirement through TVA, that's not gonna be combined in with the FERS. I don't, I have never heard, I have never known of anybody to do that, but I wouldn't think it would have any effect on the, their retirement here because we wouldn't be using that time in their retirement here. Yeah, so TVA service would not be I, I don't believe so, PMC. no. That's odd, I've never had that before. So a question, when does an employee start the voluntary contributions? Well, the voluntary contributions is only if, uh, afforded to the SERS, um, those that fall under SERS retirement system, not FERS. They can start at any time they want to, as long as they're employed and they don't owe a redeposit or a deposit. All they have to do is complete the 2804, which goes through your office and you mail it into us. There are many people that are asking for my um, email address. It is my name, Catherine, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N dot Adams, A-D-A-M-S at O-P-M dot G-O-V. Please keep in mind that I am fairly new to this section and I am currently training myself. Um, so at the present time, Bob and Pam are your go-to people. Hopefully, I might be able to get up to speed. You Can an employee ever request a refund or a partial refund of their voluntary contributions while still employed? They can request to close the account and have that money rolled over or refunded, whatever they want, but it's, it has to be all or none. It's not, there's no partial, partial refunds. And they can do it prior to retiring. Voluntary contribution account is a, is a totally separate account. So they don't have to. Uh, they don't have to wait until they retire to, to to receive the money. Question was previously pay.gov was not mentioned in the template letter that went to those who set up a VC account. Is it in the letter now? Previously pay.gov was not mentioned in the template letter that went to those who set up a VC account? Is it in the letter now? I don't know if the letter has been updated to show um, opm.gov or pay.gov, I mean, on the VC letter. I'd have to get an example to look at it to see if the system has been updated. I thought it was, but I, I don't know for sure. If you want to email me uh, to remind me to look at it, I, I'll have to pull one up to take a look at it. How can agency HR request the amount of lifetime earnings from OPM? Our voluntary contributions department in DC is the one that calculates lifetime earnings. You can email them. I'm going to put their address back up here. It's right there, general VC questions or lifetime earnings. But So you see the email, voluntary contributions at opm.gov. And another person does ask, can you explain what voluntary contributions are exactly and why they are beneficial? Are these common? Voluntary contributions account. The, this account was set up for those under SERS as a way to buy additional time so they have added, you know, monies added to their retirement. They're separate accounts. Um, from the annuity account. So if they 
however much money they put in their account, and we did show the calculation there, for every $100, they get $7 credit toward their account. So, you know, if they have $100,000 in there, if we do the math, you could see how much more they're going to get monthly or annually per their account. So, it's, the voluntary contributions account was set up solely for giving those SERS retirees additional monies to add to the retirement. A lot of people today are taking that money and, and taking it and sticking it in there and, and taking advantage of that loophole for that Roth IRAs that I mentioned earlier. How do you calculate the 10% of earnings baseline? What information do you use for voluntary contributions? That's all done down in our yeah. DC office with the voluntary contribution team. They will use the payroll records. They're good. They take payroll records. So when somebody wants to roll this money over prior to retiring and it's close, it's a high amount and they think it might be close to the limit, they're going to be going out to the HR offices trying to get payroll history of this employee so they can determine their 10% lifetime earning. But it's based all off the uh, payroll records. Have you all thought about a ticket system for deposits for agencies to submit requests? I think they mean like remedy ticket system, perhaps. We can. No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, our, we our need an application and to submit a request to yeah to uh, to submit an application or I'm not sure or status, but um, we don't have anything set up like remedy if that's what you're referring to. But our SC Billings email box is the best next thing and. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with it, you know that we are we answer it pretty quickly. Um, an, uh, an individual writes, could you please tell the listeners to get a correct VISTA letter for federal service credit? Number one, employee uses the VISTA portal to get a letter for federal service credit purposes. VISTA volunteers can go to the VISTA, VISTA portal to obtain a copy of your letter. If you do not recall how to access your VISTA portal, call the VISTA hotline 1-800-942-2677. Call to request a letter for federal service credit purposes. The hotline staff may say that you, they can generate a letter to send to you but you must insist on being transferred to the VMSU. The VMSU is the only unit that knows how to produce the correct letter and the correct amounts for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Another question about the 38124. If it was included with the retirement package to get the VC, how does it get to the VC group? Since the retirement package goes to a different group, who the specialists are adjudicating, how, how do we get it? Well, the, the retirement side is just, um, I mean, we're in the same facility. So if they get a retirement case and the voluntary contribution form, the 38124 is in that case, they're gonna forward it over to my department. How do I get set up for EHRI access? I just transferred to a small agency. Um, Ed, I think you would probably have to ask your benefit officer. I'm not sure how each agency gets access to it. I don't know. Where should specialists send applications for VC while working remotely and unable to mail it? If you're talking about the 2804, um, I'm assuming. Unfortunately, we need we need original signatures on there. So however you get those out, it's gonna have to come through the mail. I, I don't know what, what to tell you about that. You have to work something out with your agency. But OPM has not authorized uh, digital signatures on those forms yet or if they even will, I don't know. Does the VC group give SERS retirees their options 
for any excess contributions or who does? Who works refunds of SERS excess contributions? Excess contributions are conducted in the SERS pending branch. Right. Uh, the, my department, which is the refund service credit tax team, we do not we do not handle excess contributions. So when a, a case someone retires and they have 4211 and, and they have excess contributions, the adjudicator in that adjudication side is going to give them the option of what they want to do with excess contributions or excess deductions, I should say. Now, if you're talking about um, they had SARS time but didn't have five years and they had SARS excess contributions, not the 4111, those excess contributions, if that that's what you're talking about. They fill out a 1562 and send it into our office, and that's where um, have to do a rate F and get the SERS contributions and and the FERS remaining in there. If they didn't have five years by 123186, I don't know if that's excess re, um, contributions for an individual that's not entitled to um, a, a SERS component to their first yes. retirement. We do. Um, we will pay those out at retirement if if it wasn't done prior, um, and we will give them options um, uh, on what they want to do with that, how they want that payment made to them at that time. We don't see many of those anymore. How someone said the guide to recording does not allow paid and fools to be replaced in OPF. Are we are you saying we can upload them? What what I'm saying is that however they get into the employees EOPF is not a responsibility responsibility of OPM, it's responsibility of the agency. So each agency has different requirements, different uh, regulations. So um, I can't tell you how, how they get them into the OPF, but that would be something you want to check with uh, additional folks at your agency. When voluntary retirement packages are submitted and the certified summary that's included requires FICA service to be listed on the second page, is this any and all FICA service regardless of what guidelines the service falls under? And if the deposit has been paid, do we still list all FICA service on the second page of the certified summary? Um, at adjudication, they do like to have all FICA service listed on the certified summary so they can be sure that they are including everything in the computation of the annuity. Sorry, question. Can you answer That was the answer. <laughs> There's a pause there. All right, somebody said you said the course was being recorded and will be available for future viewing. Will we be able to view other benefit classes or can we just see this one? Um, please email benefits at opm.gov uh, with that question. They're the ones who are um, setting this uh, this whole entire training session sessions up. So uh, email them so they can respond. And we're down to about one minute. OK, we're. That's about it for our time. Our time's up here in one minute, so we're going to have to cut it short here. Uh, we do appreciate the numerous questions that you have, and I encourage you if we did not get to it, which I'm sure we did not because there's a lot of them, a lot of them here. Please, please send us your questions. Uh, you can send them to SC Billings email box. You can send them to uh, Pam or myself. Uh, we want to get all your questions answered for you. Um, that way, if you're doing you know, your, the job uh, effectively, uh, it's going to make it a uh, better, smoother transition for us to get the application and, and get applications out quicker. Um, the more that we get applications that need development, of course, that is what backs us up on, on the work. So uh, help us and help us to help you. And pretty much the overall, the winner will be the, uh, the employee. So we want to thank you for uh, attending this session and uh, I look forward to uh, communicating with uh, 
uh, many of you out there. I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.